everyone. Thank you. Hello and welcome to my lab. Are you ready to learn? Yeah. Are you ready to have some fun? Yeah. Well, let's get started then. In my lab, we can do a whole variety of different reactions. I want to show you right now this clear and colorless liquid. What does it look like? Water. It looks like water, and that's how I describe water as being clear and colorless. But I will tell you there's something else in there. And this liquid is also clear and colorless. And I'm going to take some of this liquid and add it to this first one right there. Isn't that neat when you mix two colorless liquids and you get something that is colorful like this? This is a combination of two substances, and they produce an insoluble third substance, and it has this beautiful color. I'm going to do an experiment in this large beaker. This beaker has a volume of four liters. I want everyone to look at it right now, because if you look at this beaker right now, you just learned how big four liters is. And you cannot unlearn it. You may forget it. That's different. <laughs> and this beaker is filled almost to the top. It's filled with three and a half liters, actually, of a clear and colorless liquid. Now, I'm going to turn the light switch on here so we can see it better. I want to show you at the bottom of the beaker, there is a magnet coated with Teflon. I'm going to turn the motor on. And can you see the magnet spin? I'm going to turn the motor a little faster. And I'm going to add a couple of small amounts of liquids. Here's the first one. I add a little bit of the first one. Anything happen? Not really. Let me add the next one. Anything happen here? Yeah. The beginning of something, huh? Let, let me add a little bit more to the first one. And I go back and add the second one. What does this look like now? Looks like a tornado. What color is the tornado? Orange. orange, right? That's why we sometimes call this experiment the orange tornado experiment. And let's add a little more of this clear and colorless liquid and see what else happens. Now it's turning into a big hurricane. I hope we never see a hurricane. I add more of the other liquid and see what happens. We can get that back again. So if you know science and you study science and pay close attention to what goes on, you can do a lot of fun experiments and you can do them safely, and you can learn a lot from them. At this time, I'd like you to welcome to my lab someone who has been my collaborator and my very good friend for a very long time. That is Dr. Rodney Schreiner. Rod Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Sam. Hello, Rod. Well, I've brought uh, for you, uh, in honor of the 37th anniversary of this Christmas lecture, I brought you a sample of element number 37. Uh, you know which element that is. That's number 37, that's rubidium. Yes, rubidium. And here is a small a sample. Small, it's a metal. It's a metal, right. Yes. And uh, how many of you have heard of rubidium? I see there are only a few chemistry students in the audience. <laughs> but, but, but Rodney, this is... This is a big anniversary for me, and you just brought me a small sample. Well, I'm sorry, but uh, rubidium is very expensive. Oh, I see. OK. Why is it so expensive? Uh, the reason rubidium is so expensive is that there's really not much use for it, so people just don't make it. I see. And furthermore, rubidium is in a family of chemical elements that has some very useful and very famous members. Uh, for example, I brought some of them along. Uh, here is uh, another one in the uh, family. Uh, this is potassium. How many of you have heard of potassium? Oh, a lot more of you have heard of potassium. Okay. And here is another member of the family. This one is sodium. How many? Oh, wow. Well, that's everybody. Yeah. Sodium is a very well-known element. And then another member of this family of elements uh, is lithium. How many have heard of lithium? Quite a few, yes, yes. Lithium's used in many batteries, so you know about lithium, too. Now, you'll notice that the rubidium is a nice, shiny metal where the others look sort of dull colored. Well, the only reason they look dull is because they've been exposed to air where the rubidium is sealed in glass and has been kept away from air. 
All of these metals, in fact, react very much with air, very vigorously with air. And so they have to be kept out of air, and they're now immersed in oil to keep the air away. They also ve react very strongly with water, and I'd like to show you how they react. So do you have some water? I have uh, water. I have good. them in these uh, tall cylinders. That's very good. Are they all right? Yes. Put them this side? Or yes, let's put them there. OK. Put them there. And I've got some samples of these uh, metals in little pieces because, uh, as I said, they're very reactive, and I don't want to use large pieces. So I've got some small pieces. And they're all uh, in oil. So we will need to remove the oil and uh, before I can show you how they react with water. So I'm going to take out the first of these metals. This is lithium. This is uh, element number three. And I'll put it on my towel and wipe off some of the oil. And Bassam will do that for the others. All right. So. I have to get the oil off, otherwise it won't react with water. The oil will keep the water away. So I think this one is clean. And now I'm going to drop it into the water, and you will see what happens. Lithium and water. That's exciting. <laughs> Something is happening. Yes, if you look really closely, you can see that there are some bubbles forming, and it's beginning to fizz. It takes a little while for the oil to get out of the way. Now I'm going to try the same thing with a uh, lump of sodium. Sodium is element number 11. So here is sodium and water. That's a little faster than the lithium. It's dancing around the surface and fizzing away. And in fact, uh, it's turned into a little ball. Now I'm going to do the same thing with a piece of potassium. Potassium is element number 19. So here is potassium and water. That's a little bit more reactive. Quite a bit more reactive. Quite a bit more reactive, yes. So, you've seen lithium, which is very slow, sodium, which is a little bit faster, potassium, which is quite a bit faster. What do you think uh, rubidium is going to do? Uh -oh. Okay. Pla let's find out. Yes, let's find out. Place your bets, and here we go. Rubidium into water. <laughs> Whoa. Are you okay? I'm okay. I'm okay, too. So, did you win your bet? Now, these elements, as you saw, are quite reactive. And we normally encounter them only in compounds. We encounter them as salts. And uh, of course, the most famous salt of all is the compound of sodium with chlorine, sodium chloride. That's table salt. And I have a solution of that here. Uh, here it is. Uh, sodium chloride, it's dissolved uh, in a solution. And I have chlorides of the other elements also. There's potassium and lithium and the element for this year, rubidium. And they're all in spray bottles because I want to show you something that happens when you spray these into a flame. So I will prepare a platform and attach my burner. And uh, get a lighter. Yes, I have one right you here. You have one? Thank you. And light my burner. OK. Now, the first one I'm going to show you is one that you've uh, seen before. You're probably very familiar with this one. If you've ever cooked pasta or potatoes and we're not watching it and it boiled over into the flame, this is going to look familiar. This is sodium. 
That bright yellow color that is in the flame when something boils over is from the sodium in the water. You put salt in the water, and the sodium produces a yellow flame. Now I'm going to uh, spray next the potassium chloride solution into the flame. And let's see what that looks like. That's a different color. It's not as bright, so maybe we can see it better if we have the lights off. Let's try it with the lights off. OK, that's a nice, that's a pretty color, isn't it? OK, now I'm going to try uh, the, the lithium chloride solution. And let's see what color that is. Oh, now that's really a nice one. In fact, I think all of you have already seen this color before. Uh, this is the color in red fireworks. This is how they make fireworks red. They put lithium into the fireworks. And then last, I'm going to show you this year's element. This is rubidium chloride solution. So it's sort of a nice, pretty blue. Isn't that pretty? Thank you. Thank you. Now, we don't uh, need to use flames to produce colors anymore. In fact, if we want colored light, there are much easier ways to do that. Uh, in fact, all we need to do is press a button. And LEDs now give us any, almost any color light we want. I have uh, this color, uh, which is, what do you call that? Blue. Blue, OK. And I've got this one, red. And I've got another one. OK, and I've got uh, this one, white. OK, good. Now, with these lights, we can uh, learn something about what the color of light means uh, using something else you're all probably very familiar with, and that is glow-in-the-dark material. How many of you have glow-in-the-dark things at home? Ah, most everybody has this. Yes. So you'll, uh, you're already familiar with this. And I have here a panel with glow-in-the-dark material on it. And I'm going to put it in the stand here. And now light, uh, the bright light in the room is shining on this panel. And the panel is absorbing that light energy and storing some of it. And it holds it for a short amount of time. And if the lights go out, we can see it releasing that energy. And so let's see if we can see the saved, the stored energy. See, it's giving off the energy that it stored. What color is this? Green. It's green light, right. Now, if you have some of this glow in the dark material, you can do experiments with colored lights with it. Uh, however, you need a dark panel first. So I have a second one here, uh, which I've been keeping in the dark, uh, so it hasn't had a chance to absorb any light energy. So I'm going to cover up the uh, first panel with the second one. And then I'm going to try to write some messages on this dark panel with a light. So here's my white light. And I'm going to see if I can write a message. Yes, I can. With a white light, I can write a message. Let's try, uh, let's try this color. OK. Yellow. Let's try. No, yellow didn't work. Uh, let's try this one. That's blue. Let's try blue. Yeah? <laughs> blue works. Blue works. And the last one is, I think, this one. Where's the button? The red one. Let's see. Does the red work? No. OK. The white one worked. The blue one worked, the yellow and the red did not. That tells us something about the energy in light colors. And uh, I'll show that to you with the lights back on. I have here a, a rainbow. The colors arranged as they are in a rainbow. Uh, the visible spectrum is the technical term for rainbow, but I'll just call it rainbow. And in a rainbow, they're arranged the colors from red to orange to yellow to green to blue to violet. 
Now, what color was the panel? Green. It was green. So it's this color right in the middle. Now, when I shown blue light onto it, blue up here, it produced green. And that tells us that you can convert green, blue light into green light. And what that means, actually, is that blue light is higher energy than green, because you can convert high energy to low. You can never get something for nothing, so you can't go from low to high. And if you look, you will see yellow is below green, so it doesn't produce any green light and the red is even lower still. So you can't get green from red, you can't get green from yellow, but you can get green from blue. How come I could get green from white? Because white contains all the colors of the rainbow, including blue. So the blue part of the white light gave us the green glow. So, little experiment. And you can try all sorts of other colors of these LEDs that are available. So, have fun. Thank you, Raj. Thank you very much. Now I'm going to do an experiment by heating a white solid that is in this test tube and uh, trying to melt it. It's a solid that is rich in oxygen. And it's actually a compound. It has more than one element. But oxygen is quite dominant in it. I'm going to melt it and see what happens when we melt it. This uh, solid is going to be used to demonstrate. Let's see. I've got to turn the heat up a little bit here so it melts. This solid will melt pretty soon. If I heat it too much, it will decompose. I don't want that to happen. Um, I'm going to do an experiment when this solid is melted um, with a sugar-coated peanut, the kind of, that you find in M&M. &M. &M. Right. So I'm going to wait until the solid is melted. Then I'm going to take one of those peanuts out. And um, here's a nice colored one. And you can see the solid is almost all gone now. There's a small lump left in there. It's all gone. There is liquid. It's boiling. I'm going to take the flame away. I'm going to take the sugar-coated peanut and put it in there. That's a very highly exothermic reaction. And we do a lot of experiments like this in my lab. I want to show you an experiment we did very recently. We put actually a wire into the mixture, a wire. It's a thermocouple. We wanted to measure the temperature changes. And I'm going to show you that right now. So if you watch the monitor, you'll be able to see it. You'll be able to see there's the M&M &M being put into the test tube. And you can see the flame. You can watch the temperature rise. That's when the sugar burns. And after the sugar burns, that uh, temperature stays pretty high. You can read the scale there. And then when the peanut, which has a lot more energy than sugar, starts burning, you can see the glow. Remember the glow was brighter after a little bit, right? There is the temperature climbing. It goes all the way up to almost, what does it say now? Almost 900 degrees. Oh, it shot beyond that. It's almost uh, 1,200 degrees Celsius, very, very hot. And then it starts cooling off. And this is an interesting way to keep track of the temperature changes that we saw visually and very vividly. Now I'd like you to focus your attention on this piece of copper that I have in the shape of an inverted V. This is the pure metal copper. What I'm going to do is heat it by uh, using a methane combustion reaction. And we will watch and see what happens when it is heated. So look at it carefully now. As I put the flame under it, the surface of the metal is very shiny right now. And it's not reacting. 
it's, it is actually unreactive with whatever is in the air. The air has in it what? Nitrogen and oxygen. About 20% oxygen, 80% uh, nitrogen. See this green color is characteristic of the emission uh, of the copper atoms when they're heated. But look at the surface. Look at the surface of the copper. The surface of the copper, <coughs> excuse me, the surface of the copper now is changing color. That's because the hot surface is reacting with oxygen from the air and it gives us copper oxide. You see the darkened color right now? Yeah. Copper oxide is what we have. Now watch carefully what I'm going to do next because I have to do it very, very safely. I'm going to turn the flame off. No more sources of ignition. Take the burner away and then open this cylinder of hydrogen and let the hydrogen gas flow out. You can hear it flowing out. I'm going to put it on top right here and you can see what happens. We get the copper, copper oxide. We get copper. When hydrogen reacts with it, I take it away, you get copper oxide. We can continue to do this as long as the surface is hot enough. I only wish I had a camera to take a picture of the expressions on your faces. I can tell you're all enjoying this. There is copper. As long as it's hot enough, the hydrogen combines with the copper oxide to give us water and pure copper, and then it goes back to being what? Copper oxide. It's actually a mixture right now, and the copper oxide is flaking off. The next experiment I'm going to do is one where I will use a device called a Tesla coil. This releases a spark. You can't see the spark right now, but when I push the button, a spark is given off. I'm going to do this experiment with these bottles that are in front of me. I'm going to show you the spark first, though, OK? So I, what happens is that this spark uh, is very strong. And when I touch one of the nails, the gap between the two nails is about half a centimeter. The spark jumps across the gap. So let me show you the spark first, OK? Here we go. We turn the lights down so you can see it. Can you see it? There, see? I take it up and down. OK, now with the lights back up. I have the other bottles that are different than this one. They're closed. They have corks on the top. They have the same nail arrangement. And they have a small amount of a clear and colorless liquid on the inside. I'm going to touch one of the nails and see if I can make the spark jump across the gap that separates them. And let's watch and see what happens. You ready? Here we go. Whoa. That was an uncontrolled combustion reaction. That's because the liquid at the bottom is ethyl alcohol. And the vapor of the alcohol was ignited, <coughs> excuse me, was ignited when the spark uh, jumped across the gap. Let's do it again. Boy, that's, that's a bit louder than the first one, right? Let's do the third one in the dark. Let's turn the lights down. Whoa. You notice that the intensity of the sound released increased with the size of the bottle. You notice that very carefully, right? That's why I want you to see what I have here. <laughs> you ready for this? All right, here we go. All the way to the top. This is the uncontrolled combustion of ethyl alcohol vapor caused by the spark jumping across the gap of the two cylinders. Well, I want to thank you for coming to join us on this very special occasion. And I want you to remember to do experiments safely, but also to remember, no matter what, science is fun. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.